recessions don't hit every business the same. Working in the sports industry encompasses a lot more than working for the Angels, the Yankees, the Mavericks, or the Cowboys. You have to be thinking, what can I do to stand out in a tight labor market? This is the Work in Sports Podcast. Here's VP of Content and Engage Learning at WorkinSports.com, Brian Clapp. Had a really fun meeting yesterday with our podcast production team where we decided our best of episodes for 2023. So as you know, longtime listeners of the show, for the month of December, we tend to do best of programming, some of our best interviews, some of our best topics, and we put that all together for the month of December to, to remember some of these moments. And I think that's really important. A lot of times we have a great guest on, they share a lot of great advice, you all listen to it, and then maybe it goes away. Maybe you're not applying it yet. And these refresh episodes where we can come back and listen to them again and pick up on some of those knowledges, just some of those combined episodes where we start to pull best of from a lot of different pieces, I get a lot of feedback from people saying, that's really helpful because now I'm reminded of how important that thing was, how impactful that was. I think we're all guilty of listening to things or reading a book and being like, that's great advice. And then we never apply it. So I don't know, make a plan, put something together for yourself to say, I'm going to start applying a lot of this knowledge a lot better in 2023. So anyway, my point is it was really fun to get together with our team and to have a conversation about, whoa, did you like this one? Or what what about that episode? And we went back and forth for a while. I think we have a really good plan together. So that'll be coming out in the next coming weeks, but we're still going to do our Monday episodes uh, fresh because these are important too. These are your questions. Just know you can always send me your questions at bclap at workinsports.com, B-C-L-A-P-P at workinsports.com, or you can message me on LinkedIn, or you can DM us on Twitter at workinsports. Get your questions in. We're ready to handle them. You know, these are important topics, what you need to know, what you need help with, and that's what we're here for. So this question today came in just yesterday from Jack in Indiana. Hey, Brian, I just listened to your interview with Mark McCullers, and I loved your first few questions where you pushed them on what a recession could mean for jobs in the sports industry. I'm a senior in college. I'm going to hit the market in Mayish, and all this talk has me really nervous. Can you give some tips and strategies to help people like me stand out even in a down labor market? Jack, thanks. Really great question. Thank you for listening to that episode. For all those people that haven't listened to it yet, Mark McCullers was the president of the Columbus crew for 14 years. And during that 14 years, he was president during the recession of 2007 through 2009. And that was a really tough time. There were a lot of businesses that shut down across, a, across many, many industries. The sports industry, we saw some contraction. There was definitely an impact. And so I asked him a lot of questions about, okay, you've lived through this. You knew those back office conversations. How close were you guys to laying people off? How close were you guys to you know, changing your policies? And, and what do you foresee for this one if this should happen again, if there is a recession coming up? And I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but I do think these are important conversations, especially for you, Jack. If you're going to be a college, you're a college senior, you're about to hit the work, workforce, you have to be thinking, what can I do to stand out in a tight labor market? So I'm glad that you're asking this. So we're going to do a little bit of historical perspective so we can kind of look to the future and, and through that lens. So let's start with the bad news. 2007, 2009, Great Recession in the United States saw teams and leagues slash hundreds of jobs. Unemployment te- peaked at about 10% in 2009, unemployment you know, nationally. And sports sponsorship was, was severely curtailed or, or canceled. So, t- so brands and other businesses weren't spending as much money in the sports industry as well. Big picture uh, status, the WNBA contracted a team and reduced its roster sizes. Teams across sports froze or reduced prices on tickets and concessions. The Phoenix Coyotes went bankrupt. The Arena Football League canceled its 2009 season. IndyCar's Detroit Grand Prix was canceled. I mean, that sounds pretty dire, right? Fans, of course, in these instances are the hardest hit. So people who are losing their job that work in some other industry, because again, a lot of people lost their jobs during that recession, not just sports industry, just a lot of people. Those are the those were often the hardest hit. The un, and those people that are unemployed, you know, I lost my job working in manufacturing. I'm not going to go buy tickets to a game or pay for beers and brats at the stadium. I mean, that's like soup. That's expensive. So those numbers went down, and it starts to kind of track. Less in stadium attendance means less in game advertising. Like if I'm Budweiser, I might be like, we're going to pull back a little bit because not as many people are going to the games. Turns into this nasty spiral and it all starts to, you know, one thing affects the other. At the same time, 
The Yankees, New York Yankees, spent $460 million in free agency on three players, Mark Teixeira, A.J. Burnett, and C.C. Zabathia. Two out of those three actually worked out for them. So the point there is not, recessions don't hit every business the same. So now let's go to the good news, okay? Sports ratings during the recession of 08, 09 held steady or grew as fans went into their went to their flat screens to forget about the Great Recession, right? We all we're all feeling kind of stressed out by this, lost our job, we don't want to go to the games. Well, we're still watching, we're still consuming, we're still interested. And at this point in 09, 08, social media hadn't even taken off to the level that it has today. So the second screen experience, that engagement, that conversation wasn't quite there. So when I talked about sports sponsorship being pulled back in 08, 09, now you might look at it and say, well, it might just be readjusted, right? So where we didn't spend on in-game activations and maybe we didn't spend with as many sponsorship deals, well, now maybe we'll just push to the digital experience. So now maybe instead of you know doing something inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium, we're going to do it on the Atlanta Falcons Twitter page you know, or something of that nature where they have 24 seven tons of followers. So it's just the, the money moves a little bit because the ratings and the engagement and the interest is still high. The NFL and ESPN and a lot of those different media and, and uh, leagues did just fine during that recession. If a new recession hits, viewers, ratings, and advertisers, and media outlets will continue to be just fine. All systems normal for big teams, leagues, and markets. There might be some contraction. There might be some uh, lessening of of employees, there might be some, you know, just staffing. If they were bloated before, they might take this as an opportunity to cut back. But you're not going to see big, huge, wide, deep cuts to a lot of these big teams and industries. Now, another case in point to make this more on the good news size right now, there's some teams on the market to be sold right now, and the valuations are insane. And what that tells you is that the business world still looks at sports properties as a massive opportunity. There's still so much business to be done there, money to be made. Here's an example. Artie Moreno is looking to sell the LA Angels, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. He bought them in 2003 for $183 million, which sounds like a ton of money. Gosh, $183 million, That's a lot of money. They haven't won much of anything. They've had some great players. They haven't won much of anything, and yet they're now valued at around $2.5 billion. So in 20 years, they went from $183 million to $2.5 billion. Wow. Okay. Robert Sarver will be selling the Phoenix Suns, and they could be worth more than $4 billion, which makes me kind of mad because Sarver should not win in this situation. But... Let's get real. Working in the sports industry encompasses a lot more than working for the Angels, the Yankees, the Mavericks, or the Cowboys. There are many smaller aspects of our industry which could be hurt in a very real way. Collegiate programs, startup leagues, fringe sports. We had this conversation during COVID. I had this with a lot of different people. Can a league like the PLL survive, the Premier Lacrosse League? What about the XFL version 2.8, whatever it is? Or axe throwing. I mean, I know that these, some of these are fringy fringe, but these have an impact, and a lot of people are employed by these leagues. I mean, fan-controlled football and whatever. They're, they're just smaller fringer leagues and college programs and athletic programs that can be hurt by a recession. So not everybody works for the Yankees. Not everybody works for the Red Sox. We have to keep a, a full holistic view of the sports industry and everybody that can be hurt from it. Okay, so Jack, that's a little bit of your background. That's a little bit of your overview historically and a little bit of a prospectus for our industry. Now let's get into a little bit of what I'm hearing because I talk to a lot of people and I want to give you insight into what I'm hearing right now. What is the, the tone that I'm hearing out there? Then we'll get into the actual advice. So far, the chatter I've been hearing on the ground talking to employers is that outside of tech and banking, Twitter is its own thing, but Meta and some other banks have, have really started to do some big layoffs and those get the headlines. Most employers outside of those two industries are taking a very different approach to this looming recession. And I think this is good news. Here's why. Nobody wants to go back to COVID days, but we're going to for this example. A lot of industries made cuts to their staff. They were like, hey, we're not making as much money. We got to contract. And they let a lot of staff go. And then they knew it was going to rebound, that it was probably going to be a quick rebound, that it's, we were going to get past this. We're going to get back to a new standard and we're going to have revenue come in again and we'll start hiring. But what happened during that time period? Leverage went so far to the job seeker that when we came back to standards and revenues jumped and it was time to hire, the cost to hire went through the roof. Competition was nuts. People were resigning from good jobs 
just for the hell of it so they could try to get a better signing bonus or up their salary somewhere else. Great resignation, great reshuffle, great re-this, whatever. We were seeing it everywhere. There was a theory that if you lay people off, they'll just hire them back in a year. Or not them specifically, maybe, but, you know, you'll hire back staff. We'll, we'll ride this out by contraction. Well, it didn't work that way. Put so much leverage in the job seeker's hands that then it went right back over the top. So now, since it became so hard to rehire the staff you needed to operate, this time around, this is a recession that is not predicted to be as deep, as long, or as worrisome as the COVID period, or as 2007 to 2009. So many businesses, from what I'm hearing and what I'm talking to people, are looking to retain or even add staff rather than let them go. They're hoarding labor that they know they'll need once the economy starts accelerating again. So if they're saying, hey, this might be a six or eight month recession, let's just hold tight. I don't want to get rid of a bunch of people and then try to hire them back at a way more expensive cost. Let's just keep them and let's figure it out. So that's good and bad, right? We like the idea of being able to put some pressure back on employers sometimes and be able to raise salaries. I'm a worker. I want, I want that too. But at the same time, I'd rather just have a job throughout. So <laughs> I'm going to stay optimistic here and say, it's good if they don't want to lay me off. <laughs> so let's just keep that in mind. All right. <laughs> so uh, what I would add to this is instead, I think they're taking a more surgical approach and saying, maybe it's a top line we need to look at the top level staff that are paid really high that may not be massive contributors anymore. Maybe there's an opportunity to do some contraction there. Maybe we've become a little bit top heavy. Maybe we've become a little bit bloated up here and we need to get rid of some of those big salaries. And in so doing, we can, we can help us ride it out for a longer period because it's those, those mid to entry to, to, you know, the the mid entry level level jobs and staffers that are becoming really hard and overinflated to replace again. So, That's just all a bit of theory going on from what I'm talking to people out there. And it's an interesting theory. And and I'm old, so uh, I'd still say I'm contributing at a very high level. So hopefully that doesn't worry me of being a bloated old salary that can be just lopped off at the knees. Right, boss? Right? You think I'm good, right? I'm just playing around a little bit. Of course, I'm high value. All that's theory. Let's deal with some realism. The job market is going to tighten. What can you do about it? Let's just assume that there's going to be a market contraction. It's going to get tighter out there. What are we going to do about it? Okay, five things. Number one, your skill set versatility means more than ever. Okay, look to those broader functional skills that may not be directly associated with your dream job, but can add value to a larger department. I'll give you this example. So let's say that you want to work in sales and you've got all these different great metrics of experience, your closing rates, your all these other great data points, and you're a good salesperson, you can prove that and you've done internships or whatever else. Adding in a skill like a Photoshop, let's say, is one of those fundamental skills that doesn't necessarily directly correlate with sales. But if a sales department has somebody within it that knows Photoshop and help can, can help create data visualizations, reports, presentations, and up the level of the group. That's a versatile skill that isn't like a directly associated with sales, but if you know it, it can propel you. It can be that 1% extra, that 5% extra that can propel you against somebody else. So now there's two people that have similar skill sets, but you've got something like Photoshop and you can leverage that. You have to leverage it. You have to let people know that you've got it. You've got to explain that. You've got to be ready to tell it in a story in your interview. You've got to be able to exemplify it in your, your resume. Maybe you, maybe you have a portfolio. But if you do and you leverage that correctly, that sort of skill, at a time when the, the department's maybe getting smaller, having somebody that can do a little bit extra outside of the scope of the role can be extremely powerful. So other skills other than Photoshop could be Salesforce, could be Excel, Google Analytics, Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere, Python, SQL. These tools, these massive, massive, massive information pieces, when you know them and you're good at them and you can leverage them as part of your entire skill set, you become a lot more valuable to the marketplace. Number two, your networking efforts need to ramp up. Okay. Put this in perspective. If I hire, I'm not saying this literally, but let's say, for example, I'm a person that hires 10 people a year. That's my yearly average. I bring in 10 staffers a year. 
in a down market, that number may be like, hey, Brian, we've only approved you for three this year, two to three this year. That's a big difference. So what does that mean? That means there's a greater risk for me, the hiring manager. I have less room for error. If I have 10 people that I hire and one isn't great, or I take a risk on somebody, or I think that they have high upside and maybe a bit of a downside too, that's okay. I can take that risk because I can kind of hide them. I can train them. I can work with them. I can kind of make it all flow. If I'm only hiring three people this year, I can't afford to make any mistakes. I can't afford to hire the wrong person. So your networking efforts tie into this. The more you can get to know people, the more you can build your network effect of people that could vouch for you, people that could place your resume in front of somebody, people that know your work product, people that can advise you into opportunities, that serves you really well right now because as a hiring manager, I want somebody, if I get their resume and I'm like, they look good, and they have uh, somebody telling me that they're good, that I know and I trust and I like, that means more than just getting a resume and cover letter that I have no connection to. That networking effort that you're making could be that 1% to 5% change that we're looking for that vaults you ahead of somebody else. So in a market where there's contraction, labor market where there's contraction, and you're not going to see as many opportunities out there, networking makes an even bigger impact than normal because that can give the confidence to a hiring manager to say, I'm comfortable going with this person. I've analyzed their skills. I've got a good recommendation. I interviewed them, et cetera. Let's go push them up to the big boss and see if they um, agree with that. So get pushing on your networking activities now, Jack, because they'll bear fruit for you six months from now, and they could be really beneficial when you're getting ready to graduate. With that same theme in mind, number three, the interview process becomes really, really, really important. You have to really master this interview process. You have to be able to convey your thoughts really clearly. You have to be charismatic. You have to be engaging. You have to be able to relate your stories really well. You have to be able to share your experience in a way that people can translate it to your workplace, to your aspiring workplace, the place you want to work. We're dealing with a contracted marketplace, and if I can only hire a couple people a year when I used to be able to hire a lot more, the people that I bring to my boss and say, this is the one, we want to hire them. I have to feel confident that you can present yourself well to my boss in that instance, because there's going to be more scrutiny than ever when we have a smaller number of people that we're looking to hire. Number four, be selective in your applications. At times of recession or market slowdowns, you'll hear a lot of advice from career advisors out there telling you to up your apply rate, apply for more jobs. It's a numbers game. It's math. The more you apply for, the higher your chance of success goes. And I think that is terrible advice. I think it's total BS. Because it's not really how the world works. Put yourself in the shoes of the employer. More unqualified applicants is a bad thing. You're just flooding my inbox with resumes that I can just dismiss really quickly. It's not really upping your chances. It is just making you feel like you're taking on more activities. So it's a false sense of security. I'm applying for a lot of jobs. Eventually something good's going to happen. No, be more intentional about it. Even more so than ever right now, be more intentional about it. I kind of liken it to the logic of playing lottery tickets. You know, you hear somebody say to themselves, well, if I spend a hundred dollars on lottery tickets, that is, I'm, I'm going to have a much better chance of winning than if I only spend $2. The reality is you just have a better chance at losing a hundred dollars because chances are you're not going to win. Technically, by the letter of the law of math, yes, you've increased your chances. They're still not good in reality. So the idea here is that I want you to still be really intentional with the jobs you apply for. Are you a good match for it? Are you customizing your materials? Are you telling a good story in your cover letter? Are you networking with the right people at the organization? If you go about it as intentionally as possible, you have a better chance than just going out there and applying for every kind of job out there and thinking the numbers are in my favor. That's not how this world works. It's, it doesn't increase your likelihood of being hired by applying for more jobs. It just means you've applied for more jobs. And that's not the goal, is it? Your job is to get hired. So being as intentional and connected to the opportunity as possible is the goal you should be aiming for, not just unnecessary activity. Number five, Consider areas in their growth phase that stand out during a recession. Okay, so there is always parts of our sports industry, because think of it as a bunch of different little groups, right? There's marketing, there's sales, there's social media, there's digital, there's media, there's all kinds of different aspects of our industry. 
Because sports is just a big business and there's all different types of things happening underneath it. Well, look at the trends. What's growing? What's got a lot of interest? What will people use during a recession? So think of it this way. In 2007 through 2009, social media was really starting to become a thing. So at that point, jobs are still on the rise in, in social media, in sports. And I was telling people then, this is an area you should be looking to get into. We're seeing an increase of jobs in social media when other parts of the industry are contracting because that was a growth opportunity. So your dream job may be to work for the Red Sox in marketing. But maybe this is the time that you start to look into the sports betting firms, right? Those are really growing right now. Or maybe you start to look into esports, or maybe you start to look into media and streaming more because, I mean, what are people doing during a recession? They may not be going to the games, but they're still going to be sitting on their couch watching. They're still going to be betting. They're still going to be playing esports. I'll be playing Xbox. I know that'll happen. So, Those are looking to those counter cyclical industries. So like the recessions happening and these are contracting, there's always going to be some that grow. So look to those and say, does it make sense for me to explore this area to increase my skills in this area? Maybe even Jack do an internship in the spring, right? Before you graduate with sports betting or something, get that little bit of experience on your resume in the time that you have left. Look for volunteer opportunities, something to build your profile in that area, because those areas may do well during a recession. And if so, you'll be primed and poised to capitalize on that. One last thing, an extra bonus point. This would technically be number six, but I just thought of this as we were talking. So I wanted to bring it up. Be flexible. I made it really clear. I don't think you should just be applying for more jobs out there for the sake of applying, but I do think you should consider more markets. You could consider remote. You could consider a different schedule. Maybe something that's a little bit frantic. The more flexible and versatile you are during this time period, the better. Work within the system that you're being presented. You'll always have a time to get back on a more regular schedule or get into the market that you want or get into the exact job that you want. But right now, we're thinking about riding out a recession, gaining experience, improving yourself, paying the bills, getting things going, having things on your resume. It's a lot better than sitting around and waiting for the market to turn. So if you go at it with this kind of intention and strategy, you'll be really well served. Thanks for listening to everybody. Get ready for our best of 2022 for the rest of the month of December. Still have some Monday episodes in there, but the Wednesdays, you're going to get some of our best stuff coming right back at you. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>